You're listening to the Born to Kick Ass podcast with Matt Tomassi and can be found at borntokickass.com slash episode 39. Welcome to the Born to Kick Ass podcast, where you're introduced to the most fascinating people on the planet. Learn the ingredients of greatness that you can apply to your life. And now your host, Matthew Tomassi. Hello listeners, podcasting is an awesome way for me to share my passion with the world and provide you with inspirational interviews. The only downside with podcasting is that it's one-way communication. My guest and I talking and you listening. Now is the time for me to start building a kick-ass tribe with people like you. People who listen to my podcast, people who hear where I'm coming from, people who want to improve themselves and want to kick ass in life. Let's start building a relationship. To get the ball rolling, I need you right now to head to my website, borntokickass.com and sign up for my free newsletter. Once again, that's borntokickass.com. Once you've signed up, I'll be able to find out from you what you want to improve in your own life, whether it's creating your own website or launching a podcast or you want to improve your health, or you want to set and achieve big goals, or whatever it may be. Sign up now. I'm looking forward to connecting with you. Mick is a former Special Forces soldier, serving over 20 years in the Australian and British Army. As a former member of the elite SAS, Mick has been on and led missions to many of the world's most dangerous war zones, including Afghanistan, Iraq, the Middle East and Africa. In this interview, Mick provides a glimpse into the world of the SAS, talks about leadership and the mindset required to be the best of the best. Enjoy the interview. Mick D, welcome to the Born to Kick Ass podcast. Thanks, Matt. Good to be here. Now, I'm really excited to have you on. Uh, you're the real deal. Uh, you are a former SAS soldier. Um, can you tell us about the SAS and what is the SAS? Like a lot of the listeners to this podcast uh, come from America. They're probably the the biggest audience. The second biggest audience are Aussies. So what does the SAS stand for and what, what is the SAS? Crikey, that's a podcast in itself there. But I guess, you know, it was formed back in the, in the deserts of uh, North Africa in World War II by David Sterling and his bunch. And the franchise, for want of a better term, has grown into a number of international um, entities. And the Australian SAS, is, is, the Australian SAS Regiment is, is one of those. Um, you know, to, for the American listeners, if you haven't heard of the SAS, I'd be really surprised. But if not, we are, uh, the equivalent of SEAL Team 6 or Delta Force, that, that type. So tier one, uh, special forces unit. Um, and typically, what do we do? What are we? Special forces. So a small group of highly trained, um, uh, selected personnel or volunteers who do jobs and tasks that um, typically can't be done or outside the scope of conventional units, I guess. And is that does it stand for Special Air Service? Yeah, Special Air Service. Yeah. Is there an SBS, Special Boat Service? Yes, there is, mate. That's, um, that belongs in, uh, in, in the British – well, it, it's Royal Navy because they're, they're predominantly Royal Marines, come from the Royal Marines, yeah. So also, what's the difference between like SAS and Commando? Is SAS sort of like a more specialised group, a smaller unit compared to Commandos or what sort of the uh, the differences there? Yeah, so if you're talking in the Australian context, um, because there's also British Royal Marine Commandos, they have a very, you know, they're an amphibious role, they're a bit more like the, the Marine Corps, um, US Marine Corps. Uh, Australian commandos have a, a different mission set. They typically operate in larger formations. 
um, substantially larger formations than uh, SAS uh, units, so different roles. Um, you know, commandos have probably Australian commandos probably argued this point, but we typically um, get the more complex um, mission sets um, and, and more surgical, smaller numbers. Um, and there's a, there's a number of um, unconventional roles that the regiment conducts as well that I can't talk about. So when did you get into the army or what sort of draw, drew you into the army? Sort of, you know, if you rewind to sort of, you know, your late teens or early 20s, what sort of drew you into the army? Yeah, look, uh, I've always wanted to be in the armed forces since I can remember, um, you know, with my, my, my wooden gun and my dog and my, my dad's slouch hat wandering off into the cane fields in Cairns um, from that moment forward, I always... Uh, there was no doubt in my mind I was going to join the armed forces at some point. I had aspirations to be a fighter pilot, but I was crap at maths. Um, so I joined the army instead. Uh, joined joined the infantry, then then went to special forces. Yeah. So it was it's in I, I truly believe it's in my blood. I come from I come from Anzac stock. I had uh, three relatives that were on the beaches uh, back in 1915, um, and couple died there, others that, that served in, in on the Western Front and others that served during World War Two. So it, it, it is in the family on both sides. Yeah. And when you when you got into the army, you, you mentioned that you're in uh, infantry. Mm-hmm. Were you, like, when you sort of uh, first got into the army, were you, did you immediately think, I want to get into the SAS now? Or was it like a gradual process, um, getting drawn towards applying for the SAS? Yeah, look, I, I mean, I, I, I joined the army. I joined the army reserve in um, eighty one, I think it was. Joined the regular army in eighty five. Um, always wanted to be an infantry soldier. Aspirationally, wanted to, you know, everyone dreams of being a special forces soldier or a spy or something like that. Um, didn't think I could do it. Uh, saw a lot of much fitter guys leave the battalion to go on the selection course or the Carter course that it was called back then um, and come back not having passed or having withdrawn voluntarily or, or uh, through through medical reasons and thought, well, if they can't make it, there's no way I will. And so there was a big mental block there and that, that block shifted when I went to the moved to the UK, got out of the Australian Army and uh, moved to the UK and um, my wife's English, so I was able to join their territorial army and um, was quite frustrated in, in the unit I was, the infantry unit I was serving with there. And um, the RSM of, of that infantry battalion was ex Hereford, X22 SAS. Um, he gave me a number to call, which was uh, a TA, a British Army TA SAS regiment uh, recruiting number. So after a few months, I <laughs> I got the courage to ring that, and uh, I did selection there, and and managed to pass it, and and that gave me the, you know, that was a a big mind paradigm mindset change for me, um, and then came back and did selection in Australia and passed that. So, so I you, did think. Sorry, go no, no, no. So you did selection twice. I did. Yeah, I thought about attempting New Zealand selection, so I'd have the trifecta, but thought that was <laughs> a stu- that was a stupid idea. It just. Uh, Bit too masochistic. <laughs> now I've seen a few docos on the actual SAS selection process, and it's like I reckon, like if I don't know if they have like a civilian version of this, but it looks pretty good. Like I'd definitely put my hand up to give it a go. Um, can you tell us what, how tough is it, and what's sort of involved uh, in the actual selection process, and how long does it go for, and what? What do, what do they do to uh, applicants? Yeah. Okay, so to touch on your first point, we're actually, you know, through the adventure group, and we can circle back to this later, but uh, we're actually going to put it, put together a um, a series of, of activities and experiences that will be as close to humanly possible to the the, the, the SAS selection process. So, that, that, so that's coming next year. So watch out for that one. Um, the process itself, I mean, it, it starts with thousands of applicants across all three services of the Australian Defence Force. And then this is no different in, in New Zealand and, and the UK as well. And through a process of, of interviews and, and some 
you know, scholastic based and aptitude tests, um, some basic uh, physical tests. You've got to get the highest possible uh, results in your basic fitness assessment and your combat f- fitness assessment and things like that. You know, your pack marches and and, and whatnot. Um, so that whittles the number the numbers down. Then you go on what's called the barrier test, um, which is sort of 36 hours or thereabouts of of both physical aptitude, mental, um, and and sort of attitudinal um, assessments, and that ends with a um, an interview. So you sit in front of a board, uh, which is typically made up of some uh, some hard hitters from the regiment, um, a psych, uh, a medical doctor, people like that, um, and and you get asked all manner of types of questions, you know, why do you want to join the regiment? What would you do in this situation? You know, so we're, we're trying to tease out, um, determine what sort of character the, the individual is, what their attitude is, what their mindset is. Are they going to be, uh, do they stand a chance yeah. of, of, of success on the, uh, on the selection course? So we typically whittle that down to anywhere between 100 to just under 200 uh, uh, applicants that then start on the SAS selection course proper, which is typically around the three-week mark. When with the actual uh, this SAS selection process, the proper one, mm. what, what what's involved in that? The three-week one. So that's the start of a, of about a fourteen to fifteen month um, training and selection process. But it it is called the selection course. So what we're doing there is we're we're assessing people for their suitability for service in the special air service regiment. Um, so physically demanding, emotionally and mentally demanding. Um, you know, if you if you like sleeping a lot, don't come on it because you don't get that much of it. Um, it, it is so. The first half of the, if I could break the course into into two halves, the first half is um, sort of skills assessment and, and teaching. We teach some skills that we then ask um, candidates to recall under pressure later. And it's typically things they haven't been uh, exposed to before, different weapon systems, different techniques and tactics, things like that. We test their navigation um, and, and clearly test their, their physical ability. Um, but the overarching thing here is the mindset and, and their, their approach and, and their, their resilience, their mental toughness, their ability to keep going and make, and make decisions under, under extreme pressure, whether that be physically, uh, physical pressure or, or, or mental or, or situational, or a combination thereof. We're after thinking soldiers. That's what that who can who who when you know the arse has fallen out of them and they're on their last their last breath can still make those those difficult assessments and and make the right ones. Do you sort of find there's a particular type of person that um, gets through? Is it sort of someone who doesn't really have an ego or someone who uh, quite self sufficient? in in uh, their approach to dealing with certain situations is there like a particular type of um, personality type that um, tends to get through these selection uh, you know the, the actual selection process or is it like a just a mixture yeah look that's a great question and and psychologists the world over have been trying to to in the western world at least have been trying to to, to grapple and come up with a profile since I've been involved um, in, in special forces, so when I was with the with the Brits, we we underwent a, a number of interviews and tests and things like that during our selection process, um, because they were trying to 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 come up with a profile, a, a, a cookie cutter, if you like, a template that that the typical special forces soldier fits, um, in order to streamline the selection process and 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 probably and and potentially target that demographic that has a higher um, chance of success. Um, the Australians did the same thing and I was involved in that too in the early 90s. Um, both, of those, both of those studies uh, or programs came up with a whole set of attributes that we pretty much knew anyway, but noted that there is no specific type of person that, that succeeds. You know? So, you know, we, we've got... The regiment is an eclectic mix of, of, you know, male humanity. It really is, but but there's certain traits and 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 um, uh, things that bind 
to bind those individuals together and you know and that is that mindset that resilience humility um relentless pursuit of excellence uh the ability to 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 analyze complex tasks under pressure um you know physically robust you must be but that as i said there's some there were bitter people on on that on my selection course who didn't make it who who didn't have that mental toughness sense of humor um ability to communicate uh, at all levels, so whether you're briefing a general or you're talking to a, to a private from, a, from another unit or another army, and that ability to win hearts and minds and engage with local populations and other people outside of the organisation, that, that's just a few. I mean, I, the list is almost endless, but that's typically what we're after. On some of the docos that I've seen, you know, there's the physical side where you do, you're doing all these physical activities and marching and included in that is the sleep deprivation. Mm-hmm. One particular documentary I saw after the first sort of half of the, um, the, the process was sort of done and dusted, they let all the applicants, I think it was in um, England, and they let all these applicants loose into sort of the, the wilderness mm-hmm. and they gave them like five-hour head start and all the guys just sort of just ran straight off, you know, in all all directions. Yep. And then sort of X number of hours later, the whole army came after them to try and find them. Their objective was to try and not be caught uh, for as long as possible. And then when yep. they were caught, they were then brought in and then interrogated. Was that something that was on the selection that you did? Yeah, look, that that's, that's part of that 14 month process that typically happens after after the selection course itself um, at, a, at, at a point in time that's determined by the staff and that changes from year to year. But um, what's what's now called conduct after capture is, is part of our, our training um, program, yeah, definitely. And, 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 you know, it's probably one of the most un, uh, – I did the British one. I did the Australian one. Um, it's not a pleasant experience, that's for sure. Yeah. It's something. Something. What? It, the idea there it, it, again. It, it, it's to prepare you for that possibility. But what it does, it steals you into that mindset of, you know, you don't want to be captured. You you will you'll do everything tactically and humanly possible to avoid capture and detection because it's not pleasant. The people who run this um, course, do they actually say to applicants? Under no circumstances are you to, you know, when you when you get um, captured as part of the uh, this selection process, um, not to give out s- uh, certain types of information. You know, maybe the interrogators are trying to find out. S- is yeah, that there, sort of part of the game? There's there's a se- there's critical elements of information that you don't want to release clearly. And, and all of that's covered in the training before you go and you, you undertake um, the tactical questioning. So yeah. that that's all covered. And I can't really go into too much detail about that. Um, yeah, uh-huh. I'll get I'll get in trouble. What was it like when you when they said to you, like you you know you've you've completed the selection process? And what was it like when they said to you, "Yep, you've passed. You're now in the club." What was that like? A, a huge relief, um, you know. A little bit of we came out, I guess. Um, it, it, very exciting um, and, and extremely rewarding. So I remember the the British one. At the end of a certain activity, we were brought in. Uh, I mean, selection over there, they, they, they you get badged, whereas over in Australia, you get beret qualified, so you beret badged. So. When I when I got badged, I got pulled in front of the, the RSM, the CO, uh, the rest of the, the training staff, and um, they asked me certain questions about how I went and certain things. How did how did I think I went overall? And you know why should we let you in? You know again why should we let you in? So it was a bit of a grilling for about 10, 15 minutes. I thought oh I've, I've, I've you know I've done my dash here, yeah. and then it was pretty uh, unceremoniously. It just sort of they had a beret sitting on the table, and I said. Uh, that's yours. Well done. Off you go. Send the next one in. All right. That would have been good. Yeah. And then after after that, it was, um, you know, a few beers and oh, quite a few beers. Uh, the Australian one uh, happened. We were a- outside of uh, one of the headquarter buildings 
um, names were called out and they were told to go up into the, uh, in, into the, um, the lecture room. And those of us remaining down on the program, we actually thought I was looking, some of the people that went up into the room, I thought had done extrap, you know, had done exceptionally well and, and, but so had some of the people that were still down on the, on the, on the hard standing. So I was a bit confused as to who, who'd passed, who'd failed. It was clear that the ones that were being called out, you know, one, one group or the other were the ones that had made it and the other group was the ones that had, that had, um, had not made the grade at the end of the course. Those of us that were left because it's a very, very high attrition rate. And, uh, the wing sergeant major just turned around and said, if you hadn't worked it out by now, you guys have made it. Well done. Um, see you up the, up the, uh, up bar in, in 20 minutes. Go and have a, go and have a, sh- a, a shower and a shave. You stink. <laughs> now, you know, obviously some of the stuff, you won't be able to talk about, but you know, from from that sort of from that point, um, are you? I'm, you're you're pretty much on call twenty four seven. Is that right? Um, it depends what role you're on, but but yes, there there is in in the cycle of your life in the unit, you, you're on call yeah. a lot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can't talk about what that notice to move is, but it's exceptionally. It goes from uh, from very short to exceptionally short. Um, yeah, it's quite disruptive for the families. I, I remember an instance um, back in the day when when there were pages. If anyone remembers those, um, the things that used to buzz on your belt and come up with a little message before we had mobile phones. Um, I remember the pager going off next to the bed at about two in the morning one one day or one morning. Um, it's, you know, gave the message to, to come in. Um, I turned to my wife, said, I've got to go. I uh, went and kissed the kids goodbye, um, because they were asleep. And then I, I kissed my wife goodbye and I said, look, I'll see you when I see you. Um, she had no idea where I was going, how long I'd be gone for. And she was left to pick up the pieces and tell, and tell our children why, why daddy wasn't, you know, why daddy was there when they went to bed and why he's not there when they woke up. So, you know, it's it's exceptionally hard on the uh, on the families. Yeah, that's something I didn't really consider. Like, you know, you sort of like for me as an outsider looking into or speaking to you and mm-hmm. looking into the uh, special forces, there is a bit of a romantic side of things. Like, oh yeah, you know, Rambo mm-hmm. and all that sort mm-hmm. of stuff. But when that particular comment you made just then, where you know you get the call. And then you basically got to go. Uh, you're going to be deployed somewhere, yeah. and you know that's that potentially could be the last time you see your family. Yeah, that's and in some of... and in some cases, for some of the families, it, it was. Mm. You know, um, lost a lot of friends along the way, um, and and comrades. You know, if you if we've got a saying, if you draw a gunfighter's pay, you've got to walk the streets. We all know the risks, but you know. The families get dragged along for for the ride, you know. Particularly the kids, they don't understand it. They don't understand, you know, what's going on. So it, it's exceptionally arduous and difficult for them. Yeah, it's it's a hard life. It really is. Now, with uh, the sort of normal day to day, this is when you're not deployed. What do, can you talk about the training? What are they, you know, what sort of tr- what training is involved with an SAS soldier? They're like. Can you maybe talk about the weapons training at all? Or yeah, look. So you know, I found a, an old training program a few years back and had a look at it, and uh, it really was a boys' own sort of um, type thing. It, 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 I looked at a month. We did a we did a week of demolitions training, then we did a week of parachuting. Um, you know, then there was a, a com- combination of small boats, you know, so zodiacs um, and and fast driving. So um, and and then a, a, a week of of um, range work. So going down the range, shooting all types of weapon systems, doing brake contact drills, you know that sort of thing. So it it, it really is, yeah, it's exciting stuff. Yeah. You don't get bored. Yeah, best job in the world. You know, um, I don't know if you've seen the movie The Matrix. There's sort <laughs> yeah, of one. There's one <laughs> scene where. Neo, he, like all this, he's like in a room and there's like uh, millions of guns and weapons and stuff. Uh, Is that yeah. what it's like when... Um... That's like my office now. No, <laughs> uh, 
No, it's not quite as uh, it's quite as specky as that, but there are certain roles where you know um, where you you have a number of guns allotted to you. Uh, yeah, they pistol, shotguns, assault rifles. Yeah. You know, um, more accurate sized weapons, belt fed weapons, things like that. So you, you what can you sort of choose uh, with the automatic weapons? Here's ten you can choose from, and you can just choose, or is that sort of how it works? Or yeah, look, uh, it, it it's not like playing golf. Well, it is a bit like playing golf, where you could take a number five iron or something like that. But but typically, it it's not a freedom of action. Um, quite like that. So your team commander, your patrol commander will say, you're carrying this, you need to carry that, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, that'll be, a, you know, from anything through to your, your, your long gun to your, your, your pistol through to your, you know, what sorts of grenades you'll carry, what sort of damage you'll, you'll carry, you know, you're going to carry a claymore mine, all, all that sort of stuff. And it depends on your role, depends on your mission very much so. So to, to say one size fits all, that's not the case. So you sit there and you plan and you get the whole team into plan because, you know, five or six heads are better than one. No one has a monopoly on good ideas. And that's one of the strengths of the unit is that we use everyone um, and for the unit and you might come up with an absolute epiphany and, and I'll sit there and go, I love that. I'll, we'll use that bit there. And you'll you plug and play bits bits of everything, you know. Yeah. Um, and then you've got to brief that back to to the higher command and make sure that they're comfortable and it, and, it, and it meets their intent and the required outcomes. So it's quite a process. So out of that drops drops out all the specialist equipment, weapon sets, weapon systems that you're going to you're going to use or you can request. It's hard to imagine, you know, like uh, even like the movie Men in Black. You know, there's sort of like a curtain. Yeah. You know, um, you've got the normal people, like I guess uh, normal civilians and just people going about their normal business, what they're exposed to in uh, in life. Mm. And then when the curtain's pulled up and you've got the special, like the stuff that you're exposed to, you know, like day-to-day stuff in the yep. army, yep. That, I reckon that'd be pretty full on. Yeah, it's almost like a parallel universe. Um, and ignorance is bliss. You know, the public doesn't need to know everything that goes on. Yeah. They just need to know that, that, that rough men – stand ready to guard the gates of hell so that they can sleep safely in their beds at night. So using a quote there from an Orwellian come Churchillian quote. With uh, the SAS, like a, like if you get deployed somewhere, how big are the teams, like your, your, your sort of team of guys that are going to get deployed somewhere, you, how big are the teams typically that go? Yeah, look, that's – that's classified, but what what drives that is available resources and and what needs to be achieved. So we'll make that that's part of that planning process. Who's going to go? How many? Right. Is it going to be a follow on? Yeah. You know, all, all that. How how can we get them there? All that sort of stuff. So there is no there is no sort of uh, cookie cutter answer to that. We don't have a you know a, a package that suits or you know the book says we've got to send this number, this number, and they've got to have this, this, and this. It, it is very much about what do we got? What, what can we, how can we get them there? Yep. And, and what needs to be achieved? What do we think we need to achieve the, the outcome? Excuse me. That out, that the government or the coalition or whoever uh, requires us to achieve. Yep. So it, 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 it could be, could be one, it could be dozens, you know. Do you ever sort of get deployed on missions where the Australian government aren't, the guys running the show, like oh, I don't know if you can talk about this, but no, Every, everything has to be sanctioned by um, at, at some some level, or, you know, through an agreement that um, that that the Australian government has to be comfortable with. Yeah. That's my understanding. When a team sort of gets deployed, are there sort of specialists within the SAS? Like on, just say, there's a team of six that go out somewhere. Mm-hmm. Would there be like a specialist? medic, a specialist, sniper, um, is there sort of specialist like that or are you all sort of skilled up equally? Yeah, look, there's always – there's roles within each team um, and, and two of those roles you've already mentioned, you know, is a medic and we have a communicator, a signal, a signals guy 
Um, you've got the commander, you've got a second in command, you've got guys that are that are given those tasks. Typically within that within that team, there'll be redundancy in those in those uh, skill sets. Um, and in some skill sets, everyone on that team will have been trained in that. But there are a, a number of smaller or niche um, capabilities that not everyone is completely trained in or are the subject matter experts in in that team. But Everyone should be able to do every job to a certain degree. Yeah. That's that's one of our strengths. Yeah. Can you maybe tell us about? I don't know. You probably can't say where, but um, what was it like when you, you know, early days when you first oh. got the tap on the shoulder, or you, you know, you got the uh, the call on your pager saying, "Okay, now it's game on. We you're you got to come in and you're going to get deployed somewhere." What was that feeling like? The very first mission that you're sent on yeah well let, let me just sort of couch this you know we're not war junkies um we, we serve we do a job which is just a bit different to everyone else and it takes all types of people to make up a society a functioning society which australia typically is generally is um so it, it would be akin to being a wallaby and and sitting on the bench waiting to get that call on for your first, you know, you pull the jersey on, you want to get the run on the field. So it's a bit like that and, and not going on operations ever. And there was a long period there where the Australian Defence Board didn't. It was 20-plus 20 20 years. Um, it would be like sitting on the bench and never getting a chance to, you know, be like Quade Cooper a few years back, um, not getting a run on. Yeah. So, but, you know, it, it, it's, it's very humbling. It's a huge responsibility. It's exciting. It's scary. It's all those things all wrapped into into one little little package. But you know, there's to a to a person, to a man, there's no one that sits there and goes, you know what, I'll sit this, I'll sit this one out, thanks. Um, and and that's you know, you talk about courage and bravery. Every single person that wears that beret is is, is a brave person just to get through the training, um, to be to get to a saber squadron. You you do some brave things, yeah. some very brave things. Just on the training that you mentioned, um, I've heard and read that uh, you use live ammunition. Is that correct? G'day guys, Matt here. This podcast is a labor of love and all episodes are researched, scheduled, edited, created and promoted in my spare time. Typically, after an episode has been recorded, it can take another three hours of post-production activities to get the final cut. If I'm providing you with value and you wish to support my vision of sharing these inspirational stories to the world, you can do so at borntokickass.com and click on the Patreon banner. Your support will help to maintain the monthly podcast running costs and enable me to outsource repetitive tasks so I can bring you even more kick-ass episodes. Once again, if you want to support me in producing this podcast, head over to borntokickass.com and click on the Patreon banner. You can't miss it. And now back to the rest of the show. Just on the training that you mentioned, um... I've heard and read that uh, you use live ammunition. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Live, live, live firing forms a large part of of what we do because that's realism in training. Um, there's a lot of pre work. We don't just go here's your live rounds. Let's go. There's a lot of what we call dry practices and, and rehearsals and muscle memory um, uh, that we do before we get to that stage. Yeah. So. That's that's the pinnacle when we when we do that, um, yeah. And, and there's there's few there's very few other units in the in the world that that do the types of live firing activities that, that we do to the to the level we do. I remember seeing this documentary on, I think it was it was in the early eighties in London. One of the embassies got uh, raided. Mm-hmm. Um, Iranian embassy, yeah. nineteen eighty. Yep. Uh, they were interviewing a lot, uh, a lot of the soldiers, and when they stormed in, 
they basically took out you know a number of the um, terrorists, mm-hmm. and they basic what they, what sort of surprised me was when when they went in and you know sort of neutralized the place, they basically handcuffed everyone like they just got everyone like you know in the movies where you see um it's special forces go in and they take out the bad guys and everyone sort of is there and everyone hugs them yeah yeah. Yeah. (laughs) there's that sort of thing but what they were sort of saying was they basically just got people and just literally threw them down the stairs one after the other and just like handcuffed every single one of them until you know, they could uh, identify that, yep, you're you're a good guy, you're, you know, you're not a terrorist. Yeah, yep. Is that sort of how it is in... Uh... Yeah, look, well, I, you know, I, 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 in my, since leaving the unit, I've, I've run and designed and produced a number of what what's colloquially known as HEAT courses, which is a hostile environment awareness training. And we talk about surviving hostage situations and... and we spend a number of minutes talking about what happens if a rescue force comes in and, you know, there's a whole thing, load of things we say, like don't move, stay low, do as you're told, all that, don't, no sudden movements. Um, but part of what I say as well is don't think it's going to be all, all beer and Skittles once the shooting stops, um, whether it's in a domestic or an overseas environment, because the assaulters, the guys that have come in, don't know for certain who's good and who's bad. So there is a process to go through um, before that can be determined, you know, to a reasonable level before the hostages can then be, you know, further processed and got on the on the plane if it's overseas or, or the extraction means overseas. So, and, and they will treat you quite roughly um, because they don't have the time to sit there and, and it, it, you know, the, the fight's still going on for them. There's still a threat. There's still danger. So, that process is is quite robust in both handling and and its process. Uh, it needs to be. Um, uh, it's there for a reason. So yeah, you know what what happened what happened in uh, 1980 in the Iranian embassy is not is not uh, dissimilar to to how things unfold. Yeah, I read the book Bravo Two Zero. Mm-hmm. One of the things that they sort of mentioned in the book was before these guys sort of got deployed, they had a couple things. One one was like a belt and inside the belt was a number of sort of gold sovereigns, solid yep. gold to yep. use for bartering or bribing mm-hmm. or whatever. Uh, and the other thing that it was mentioned in this book, they had uh, each soldier was given one or two sort of cyanide pills to, to, to take if they got captured. Is that something, is that real or is that – made up in the in the book or is that something that the SAS soldiers are given? You know, like a gold, you know, like if you go out on some mission to bribe so, your way out of stuff? Or? Yeah, so look, th- there are certain items of equipment and certain processes put in place to assist us if we have to go into what we call ENR, you know, evade and recovery. Um, it used to be called E&E, escape and evasion. It's now called ENR. Um, because you don't want to get caught, so the escape bit isn't, you know, we don't talk about that because it's nasty. So yeah, there are some things there, whether that's gold sovereigns or, or US dollars or whatever. I mean, there's, there's, there's things put in place to assist if you are operating behind enemy lines uh, to help facilitate your speedy recovery back to the friendly side of a border. Um, as far as the other, I've never heard of cyanide pills. Um, if someone gave me those, I'd probably tell them to jam up their bum. I'll make that decision on the day. Thanks very much. I've got a gun if I need to do that. When you enter another country, do you get dropped in? Do you parachute in or do you go through your normal, you know, your line up at, in the, um, you know, with all the other civilians that have got off a particular airline? Do you sort of go through immigration that way or do they sort of sneak you in the back door or how do you sort of get in? Can you talk about that? Yeah, look, it depends on what the – what the task is and what the, you know, so w- w- what I will say is, for, for example, my troop in, uh, in the invasion of Iraq back in 2003, um, we went in by um, Special Forces uh, Spec Ops Chinooks, flew us into deep into Western Iraq. So in that instance, that's how we got in there. 
other operations of, you know, early days. Um, Afghanistan, we flew in by C-17 into Fog Rhino. Um, yeah, so it just depends, mate. Yeah. How many countries you have you been to? Oh, I have to look at my passport, but I think it's about 80, somewhere in there. Yeah. And Trying to get to the 100 mark. All right. Uh, yeah, and I'm guessing most of those, are they the, the worst places on earth? You know, like yeah, look, Afghanistan. Ten, and... Yeah, conflicts tend to, to happen in shitty countries, are us. I'm waiting for the Maldives to, to cook off so we can, <laughs> you know, yeah. sort of a semi, sort of decent place. No, yeah, been to some some interesting places, some challenging places where, where you know, where you see the best and the worst of humanity, you know, some exceptionally poor people. Um, yeah, it typically happens in, in those sorts of areas. Yeah. When you go on a particular mission, is it like some missions vary between you get, you've got to go in and take out some particular, um, take out someone or try and rescue? Is there like rescue missions or go in and destroy something, you know, buildings or take people out? Is it like a combination of that sort of stuff? Or Yeah, look, the... I really can't talk about it, but I guess, you know, it doesn't take the brains of an archbishop to to look at movies and books that are out there to work out the, the type of mission sets that we do. It, 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 as I said at the start, it's typically those that are beyond the scope or beyond the capability of other units. Yeah. So it, 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 it varies widely. Yeah. With the missions you've been on, um, has it been a – have you been on sort of jungle-based missions versus urban-based missions? You know, like you might mm. might have been dropped into, you know, yeah. somewhere like the Amazon jungle yeah. versus, um, you know, a really built-up place in Syria, for example. Yeah. Is, have you ever been in those sort of situations, those environments? So uh, I guess me personally, I've operated in the jungle, I've operated in urban, I've operated, I've operated in desert. I've operated, operated in that urban, rural fringe um, at altitude, cold weather, hot weather, humid. Yeah, so uh, a range of a range of um, environmental yeah. areas, I guess. Yeah, and and I have to say, look, jungle is unrelenting. It, it's an enemy in itself. Um, so that environment's particularly hard. I mean, each environment has its challenges, uh, without a doubt. Um, but from a tactical and threat perspective, you know, that urban fringe is, is extremely difficult to operate in, um, in particular mission sets. How do you sort of deal with, like, you know, whatever sort of environment you're in, whether it's urban or jungle or, or desert, mm-hmm. how do you sort of deal with, like, and, and you know, this sort of relates to, um, like, endurance sports as well, uh, where you're in a real low point mentally and you just, you just don't want to be there. You're you just you're tired, you're dehydrated, you're you're starving, sleep deprived, and you just don't want to be there. You're mentally in a real bad low point. Do you sort of have any tips or techniques that you use yourself or have used that um, helps you get through those real bad tough times? Yeah, look, I, you know that I I, I I do the occasional ultra uh, marathon. Because I, I enjoy that, you know, your alter ego sitting on left and right shoulder, and you're, it's almost an out of body experience as you're arguing with yourself about, to, you know, it, just give up, you know, all that sort of stuff. So, I, I, I'm a bit strange. I look forward to those points um, in those activities because that's what that activity is all about. Really, it's about, you know, I don't care about the rest of the runners or where I come in. It, it's about confronting your own demons. For me, I guess back in the day. The, the the peer pressure in a in a team is you, you don't you want to you don't want to be that guy that lets anyone else down or lets the side down or contributes to mission failure or, or not the level of success of the mission that you could you could have potentially um, you know uh, achieved you know brave men have fought and died to to build that reputation of the unit um, not just the Australian regiment but the, the brand itself that SAS brand. And, and it is an awesome reputation and rightly so. Uh, and, and as the gatekeeper or the upholder of those traditions and, and standards on the day, you, you don't want to be that guy. And as a commander, you, you've got 
X number of other guys that are looking to you um, to, to lead them on a mission and to get them out of the shit. Uh, and if you lose your shit, well, then, it, you know, uh, panic and, and fear is infectious. You, you can't show that. You've got to keep it in. You've got to keep it together. And, and in that time, you know, I rarely think about my family in those circumstances because it's too distracting. It, when times get tough, it's about the guide of your left and the guide of, to, to, to the right of you. And that's, you know, it, it's that. And I think Australians do that really well, particularly in the, in the services, uh, that, that, that mateship, that spirit of Anzac. You fall, you know, you, you draw strength from that and you, you get the job done. What's it like having bullets whiz past you? Like in, like I, I can only imagine what it's like. And, you know, you see stuff on the movies and that, but, you know, when you're in a war zone, yeah. You're in you're you're in the front line of a war zone. You're right in the thick of it. Yeah. What's it like? Because you know, like in the movies, a bullet sort mm. of comes from the front and goes behind you. But in real life, mm. if you're sort of embedded within some town that's uh, under you know that where there's a war zone, you, there's bullets sort of coming from every direction and stuff like that. What's that like? Yeah. Look, I mean, you know, the first time that you're in contact, you, you never forget that. And it's, it's a sobering experience. Um, look, uh, for those that have been in combat, when you're, you're, you're never more alive than when you're staring, you know, death in, or danger in the face. It, it, it is, it, it, it's scary and exhilarating all at the same time. And when you're working with a really good team, it, it, it actually, it gels well and it, and, it, and it goes well, as long as everyone gets out, obviously. Um, touch wood, I've been lucky. Everyone never lost anyone. Um, so th- there's that element of it. Um, as far as, you know, I've probably been shot at as much since I've left the regiment than well, probably more actually, um, working in that, in that contractor, that security contractor environment yeah. than I did when I was back in the regiment, um, which sounds, sounds strange, but a lot of the missions I, took part in were that if you had if you fired a shot or you were shot at that was almost mission failure because we were there clandestinely gathering in the intelligence um there were other missions where where it wasn't that and you know it was a bit more marauding in nature yeah. but um you know i always believe it's it, it takes more discipline not to fire a shot than it does to fire a shot which sounds about a bit counterintuitive but those you know those that have been in those situations will understand what i'm saying um, so look, it's unnerving. It's a, it, it depends. It depends whether you initiate contact or whether they, or the bad guys do. You know, if the bad guys initiate contact, you've lost the initiative. That, that's that's not a good situation. And there's, you know, there's been gunfights or or times when I've been shot at where I still don't know where those rounds were coming from, uh, and, and those that were with me don't either. You know, it it, it is at times very hard to determine. Um, where it comes from even even when there's tracer involved you know you get in the desert where, where it's low visibility sandstorm conditions um it's hard to see that tracer it really is yeah. and and the splash yeah. with um the desert environments that you've been in how do you manage your you know your food and your fluid intake um you know like if you're you're on a mission and you need to travel uh, on foot somewhere over, I don't know, many days, for example, how do you care? Or how do you, do, how do you manage uh, the intake of fluids, for example, water? Where do you get your water from? Well, if you're on foot, you get your water from off your back. Um, so you've got to carry a lot of it. And, and so longest patrol I've ever done is on foot was 28 days. And we, we jumped in on that. And then move to a another spot to receive a a, a cache by a parachute as well, and, and we then have to move that cache and dig it in, and then we service that cache every eight days or so to to resupply. Yeah. Um, you know, in in hot humid conditions, you're typically only operating on a liter and a half a day. Oh. Um, in some instances, uh, you know, if it's a jungle, you can obviously resupply. If it's a wet season. Um, you get that torrential rain in the afternoon, which is always good for resupply. Yeah. Um, but in the, in the desert on foot, you know, I, I've been lucky that I haven't done that many foot patrols 
in that environment. A lot of the time we're in vehicles there and that's just like having taking a, a shop with you. You've got, you know, you can pack that full of ammunition and food. Mm. And and there we were resupplied again. So let's let's take the invasion of Iraq where we were all vehicle mounted. Um we were we were resupplied by parachute. US Air Force would come in, combat talons at in the dead of night and drop uh, drop pallets of ammunition, food, water, all that sort of stuff. And I remember the first resupply we got from uh, from those guys, we we cracked open the food pallet, and on the top were freezing cold. They were in their little own little cool and hot boxes, but there were hot pizzas in there. All right. We got a half a pizza each. Yeah, I mean, good. And and a couple of cold cans of cake and a couple of Mars bars. It's yeah. like God, God bless America. Thanks. <laughs> you know. Yeah, it would so, be good. You know, we we do it tough a lot of the time, but sometimes there's a, a little bit of luxury in there. Yep. Yeah. Also, is it true you need to like this? Was it coming from the book um, Bravo Two Zero? Mm-hmm. Um, do you need to crap in a bag and carry your own crap? Because, like in the book, um, they sort of said that you know if you take your crap in the <clears throat> out in the desert somewhere that or you know other animals and stuff will come and that may attract attention. Yeah. Is that true? Or look, look, you know that I'm, I'm sure my. My British friends will be emailing me or calling me after this, but um, th- that's that's an urban thing. Um, leaving sign, you know, certainly Northern Ireland type operations, they did that, and and in some rural type operations, you would do that as well. Um, I haven't done it much. Typically, with the Australians, if if they find the crap you had a couple of hours ago. They're going to find other sign there as well. I mean, it, that is a you know that is conclusive what we call conclusive sign. You know, human feces look very much different to to other. Um, so yeah, it is a bit of a giveaway. Uh, I mean, the key to you know anyone don't try this at home, but if you're going to try and uh, shit into a, a Ziploc bag, it takes a bit of a uh, bit of practice. And the a tip for young players is take some uh, a roll of of cling film. Because you can lay that down, do the do and that, wrap that up, and then put it in your Ziploc bag. All right. So the, the, the trick, tip for the young players there, and the other the other thing with the uh, with cling film is multi use. Um, you can use it for burns, you can use it for sucking chest, protruding gut wounds, things like that. So. All right. How heavy is the gear? Like if you you're out on a, a mission somewhere, and you know you've got weapons on you plus ammo plus your other supplies and food and stuff like that how heavy typically is all your gear on a, like a sort of a an, a typical sort of mission yeah look it depends on duration depends with your foot mounted with your vehicle mounted things like that um clearly if you've got a if you've got a car or a taxi as we call them um you can carry a lot more and it and it doesn't hurt as much you always have your pack there you always have your pack there so that if you have to go on foot or the vehicle gets breaks down or gets destroyed you can grab it and go um, look, early days, Afghanistan, doing foot patrols at altitude, some of those packs were ridiculously heavy. You know, we're talking 55, 65 kilograms, depending on what you're carrying and what your task was. Typically, you know, Timor, um, what we call all green rolls, uh, your pack, patrol pack, typically about 35 to just under 40. If you're the, if you're the signaler, you might be a bit, you know, back in the day when we had bigger radios, I think my heaviest pack in, in green rolls was about 46 kilograms. Yeah. Carry, I think my heaviest pack all up was 63, 64, something like that. You know, it's hard, you, you need someone someone else to get you up. You know, we've got a particular little dance we do to get everyone up and yeah. help help the person that get, gets up first without a pack. To, so, you know, you, you, you're almost existing there. The, the patrolling is... There's a degradation in, in your tactical ability uh, because of that weight, yeah. for sure. If you are out on a mission somewhere and it goes to shit and you need to, you know, call in for help, mm. how quickly can help get to you, whether it's air support or other guys on the ground or, like, if you sort of send out, like, a help, uh, mm. you know, put your sort of on the radio, oh, we need help type thing. Yep. How quick... Um, can help uh, arrive? Well, again, it depends where you are, what you're doing, how many other units are in the field, what size, you know, you might help might come with, from within 
the unit that's deployed. You might have another patrol nearby or you might be big enough to there and then support, mutually support one another. Mm. The other thing is depend, you know, if, if you're talking Timor or Afghanistan where there was Ford, you know, Ford operating bases, you know, Town Cout or, or um, you know, Balibo or whatever, or Dili back in the early days, it, it, it just depends. It depends on the availability of assets, depends how many other call signs are in contact. Um, in, in Iraq, help was a long way away. You know, Medivac, we talk about the gold now these days. Our Kazavac was, it was going to take us, it was going to take the, the Kazavac helos two and a half hours to get to us, um, let alone the flight back. So if you've got a, if you're a pry one casually, it, it's not looking good for you. You know, and and fast air. I mean, you 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 put out a broadcast coalition call sign in contact. You know, everyone focuses in, and whatever assets that are available get vectored to you as soon as possible. So it it really does depend. Yeah. Could be could be a matter of minutes. Could be much much longer. Yeah. Tell us about leadership within the SAS and uh, what you've learnt yourself and what they teach in in you know, I guess in the uh, context of leadership. So I'll define leadership. I'll, I'll, I'll differentiate here. You know, command is a subset of, of leadership. And, you know, typically in the military context, context, people command. I mean, they do lead, but command is it you do what I say. Um, it's a little bit different in the unit because the guys there will certainly, if they think it's a bad idea, they'll let you know. So it is more about leadership than command. They won't blindly follow you. They, they've got to be invested in the outcome. So it, it, it is about leading from the front, lead by example. It, they don't tolerate hypocrites. Um, you've got to be competent because if you're not, one, you'll get people hurt and or two, you won't last long. Um, so it's about being exceptionally good at your, your job. It's about caring for your people, making the hard, the hard calls because leadership isn't a popularity contest. Um, it can be very, very lonely at the top. You know, and I, there was a number of instances where I'd turn around to the boys and say, what do you think? And they'd say, you're the patrol commander, you make the call. You know, there's a couple of hard calls there. Um, so, you know, accountability and responsibility does buck stops with you as the, as the combat leader on the ground. Um, and, and that's one of the great things about the job, best job in the world, patrol commander in the SAS regiment, is that you are making tactical decisions Typically in a clandestine, always in a hostile environment, but they have they they have geopolitical and strategic implications, the consequences of your decisions, and that. So you 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 know constantly thinking, if I do this, what is going to be the second, third, fourth order effects? What's how's this going to affect not just the patrol or the you know the units that are here, the battle, whatever? It's about how's this going to look on CNN. How is this going to influence the, the political picture, you know, the outcomes that are required at that higher level? So, you know, it, it is a, you know, when we say we talk about we need thinking soldiers, that's the sort of pressure that you're operating under at, at you know, in some circumstances. Not always the case, um, but but had a few instances where if I got it wrong, then, the, you know, the consequences not only for the patrol would have been dire, but certainly for, you know, regionally and things like that. Yeah. If stuff goes to shit, and then mm. afterwards, mm. you know, you you go back, you're, you're back in Australia. After every mission, or is there like a a review of yeah. how, like, whether it was good or bad? Like, is there a, like a review done and like a lessons learnt um, process that's done post mission? Absolutely. Sometimes that happens uh, a bit sooner than that. Like, you know, once you're out of the out of the shit. There could be some uh, some heated exchanges there, um, but typically what we do is we call it what we call a hot wash. So that is, uh, you know, the gloves are off. Let's get it. Let's let's talk. Uh, it's a robust discussion about how things went, and then what follows from that is usually a a, a, a more in depth analysis. Um, and you know what you learn more from your mistakes than you do from your successes because everyone wants to high five and uh, say how good was that. Um, if it went well, if it didn't go so well, then you sit there and you go, wow, okay, what did we do wrong? What could we do better? I mean, and, and the, the first point of call I always um, take when conducting an analysis is me. You know, what could I have done better to make this more successful or did I set 
the team up or an individual up as best I could for success or, or was there something I didn't do or did do that, that contributed to that, that failure? And that, that ability, that sense of humility, you know, to own your mistakes, but also to, to allow your people to make mistakes as long as they're not catastrophic ones, clearly. Um, but you know, if you don't make mistakes, you don't grow, you don't grow, you go the way of a dinosaur. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us about friendly fire. How, how of a. It's not. Sorry? It's not. It's not? Yeah, well, it's not friendly. That's a joke. <laughs> How much of a risk is that? Like when you're out in the middle of, you know, a war zone mm. and there's other um, there's other units sort of all around scattered everywhere. How, how much of a possibility is that? Yeah, it's, it's always a risk um, on the ground for ground call signs. That's why your awareness, your situational awareness, your battlefield awareness where where other units are, where other elements of your call sign are as well, um, is critical. So that, you know, that's why we, we select and train the people we do so that they have that ability to analyze and assess and that situational awareness. So that helps, uh, negate that or not negate, but reduce. Um, you know, there's been times when, when it's been close and you had to get on, you know, get on the, the phone on the, on the radio or, or, or pop smoke or, or do whatever, put some sort of visual indicator there that, um, that we're not the bad guys. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, battle is confusing. Anyone that thinks it runs like, you know, uh, a, a dance routine, a well orchestrated dance routine or something like that, that's a really poor, poor analogy, but it, it is confusing. It's chaos. Uh, we just try to bring a little bit of organization to that chaos. Um, but it's always it's always a bit chaotic, yeah. particularly when it first breaks out. Particularly if if you have an initiated contact trying to find out where where the, the rounds are coming from, where that firing position is, how many there are, so on and so forth. The other thing we've got to be careful of is is you know the fast air or, or the helicopters, particularly fast air. You know, jet jockeys, fast air drivers love dropping bombs. Um, there's been a number of times when, uh, particularly in Iraq. Where the the coalition fast air have taken a, an unhealthy interest in in the patrol or, or the troop or or the squadron on the ground, uh, and we, we've got processes and technology there to to help manage that. And you know, the majority of the time that that works well. Yeah. But my, my my joke was, you know, friendly fire isn't friendly because it, yeah. it'll still you know friendly bullet will kill you just as yeah. dead as a, yeah. as a as a unfriendly one. Yeah. After your you know, you, you've served um, your time in the army, like a mm-hmm. couple of decades. Uh, how long were you in the army for? Well, I'm still a reservist, so yeah. um, still serving. But um, regular army, I think, it was 17 years in reserve time. More like now, I've, I'm just cracked the 25 years. I think. Yeah. So, so like- when you say reservist, are you, you know, once you uh, become a member of the or get into the SAS, are you? Can they still call you to to go out on missions, or not? Really, not or can't really talk about that. Post army career, um, mm. did you? What was your career like post army? Were you sort of doing private contract work, or were you sort of working for uh, companies? You know, doing sort of uh, office office jobs. What, what were you sort of, sort of doing post army? Yeah, me and officers office work. Um, don't get on that well. Um, so yeah, look, I, I, during my my latter years in the regiment, I did a degree in security management. So, uh, and security was an easy thing to fall into after I left in 2004. And there were a number of conflicts, you know, Afghanistan, Iraq were were still happening at that stage. You know, still are to a degree. So. Con- security contractor work was an easy thing to, to fall into. Initially, I went and was a security advisor, or they call them a risk advisor for CNN, Fox News, um, Al Jazeera, people like that. So I went, went to some interesting places, did some interesting things there. And I have to say the level of threat um, probably had more near-death experiences in that year that I was doing that job than, than the rest of my time combined because they, you know, they want to go where the danger is. Um, and, and there's some fairly, uh, some strong personalities in that world, shall we say? 
um, and they don't necessarily accept or listen to advice readily. Uh, so that was that was an interesting that was a that was a, a paradigm shift. That was a you know from chalk and cheese that world. Uh, decided to leave that. Spent a bit of time uh, in the election world, both in Iraq and Afghanistan, United Nations, and then ended up running uh, uh, the security risk management, crisis management side of the shop for a large American telco who, who was providing cellular networks in, in Iraq for Department of Defense, Department of State. And from that, they asked me to run Middle East, Africa, Central Asia for them on the corporate side after, you know, four or so years in, in Iraq doing that. Uh, and I, and I, I ran that corporately for them for a number of years and then decided to go into business for myself yeah. after that, which has been a journey of discovery, that has, that's for sure. Which is where we're at now, you know, with the adventure group, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Can you tell us about that? The uh, the adventure group. So the adventure group, I mean, it's probably been 30 years in the making. Every time we were in a holding area or something like that, me and the boys would talk about bringing, distilling what special forces do well and bringing that, those skill sets that are appropriate and applicable um, and, and that sort of, that essence of the boys' own adventure and the, the sexier side of, of, of special forces into uh, into a commercially sort of viable and, and packageable entity, and I guess the adventure group is is our version of that. You know, so uh, you know the elevator pitch is the adventure group provides special forces inspired adventures and experiences for individual groups, families, corporates, and the truly daring. You know, we, we've got a range of offerings from from our entry level uh, type activities, which we call the caves. Um, through to our tier three and tier four, our top tier ones, you know, the tier four, we don't really, that's invitation only, that's, that's some truly exceptional and, and very unique expeditions and, and activities. And then the next one down is the special operations experience, which is basically where you go, you get given a, a, a problem and you've got to plan a mission around it and execute it. So it typically involves parachuting helicopters you know, some fast cars, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So it's a bit, it's pretty sexy, that. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. What's the website for that adventure group? So website is www.hqtag.com. Um, we're also on Facebook. If you if you punch in the Adventure Group International into Facebook, that'll get you there, or Twitter is, is HQTag as well. Yeah. yeah, cool. I'll put those links in the show notes. Um, yeah, it's been fascinating speaking with you and there's a lot more stuff I could definitely ask you about. Um, sure. Before we go, what's the mm. worst place you've been to? Oh, God. Is there a particular one that's just the... I've got to be careful what I say. I might not be invited back. Um, yeah, the worst place. Look, uh, my least favourite country that I've visited would have to be Saudi Arabia. Um, I've, I've not been there on an operational. This is purely... After after the fact, um, you know, corporate world, it's it's just very restrictive. I'd I'd actually prefer to go to Baghdad or Kabul than, than Riyadh. Yeah. Uh, it's personal um, personal preference, I guess. Um, my worst experience outside of being you know in mortal danger, I guess, was was having um, severe dysentery in in Afghanistan. Um, for about 48 hours, both ends, that wasn't much fun. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> it's quite debilitating and not much you can do about it there either um, to, to, to a large degree. So, look, summer, summer in, in the jungle is, is hideous. Summer in the desert is hideous. So they're probably the two worst yeah. things, I'd say. Just a couple questions on advice. If you could make a phone call to the 20-year-old Mick and give mm -hmm. him some advice, what would you tell yep. him? I'd probably tell him to do selection earlier. Yep. Trust yourself, go hard, get it done. Yep. I procrastinated for years. Procrastinate, you know, that this whole mindset thing. Mindset is king. Mindset is everything. You 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 know, your brain is your best friend and your worst enemy all wrapped up in, in that one head. Um, you know, self doubt is one of the, the biggest disablers in in the world. You know, yeah. um, the, I've seen humans achieve remarkable things. You know, the body, your mind will give in before your body does. 
your mind will say, oh, I can't do this anymore before you either lose consciousness or you, or, or, or you know, your system fails or you, you know, you blow a muscle or something, you know, it, your, your mind is everything. If you get that mindset right, um, you're laughing. And if I had not procrastinated for years, I would have had a, you know, a few more years of what is the best job in the world. If you could give some advice to a listener out there who is mm -hmm. wanting to get into the special forces, mm -hmm. what what is there any uh, advice you could give them um, for someone wanting to follow that particular path? Well, they need to need to explore whichever country they're in. They need to explore the pathway to do that. So typically here in Australia, and I think it's the same in, in, in the UK and New Zealand, you have to have been in a one of the services for two years before you can apply. Um, typically we don't take younger people um, because they just don't have the maturity and the world experience and that that mental uh, maturity and resilience required. There are exceptions. Um, but uh, my advice is if you're thinking about it and you truly, truly want it because you've got to want it a lot because it hurts, um, give it a crack. Better to die knowing than die not knowing. Have a go. Just one last question before we go. You mentioned before we started the interview um, the culture of success, and yet there were three mm. pillars. Yep. Can you maybe um, talk about that? Yeah, so I do, I do some speaking around this and some workshops. And, uh, you know, it's not my secret, but I, I have this thing called the culture of success because a culture of an organisation or a team or, or any sort of entity or even your own personal culture is – culture is king you know mindset sits sits in that in that uh under the culture and the culture for, of success for me is trust team and leadership you get those three pillars correct or as correct as you can then um then success will follow um yeah thanks again for coming on i uh, no really appreciate your time pleasure and, um yeah good luck with everything uh moving forward thanks mate okay cheers good to talk to you You've just been listening to the Born to Kick-Ass podcast at borntokickass.com. If you liked what you heard and want more, please subscribe on iTunes, give a five-star rating and a kick-ass review. This really helps to boost our presence and continues to allow us to introduce you to the most fascinating people on the planet. Welcome aboard and catch you next time.